down with the patriarchy. Okay, hold on. Don't don't turn this off just yet. Whether you promote this statement or it makes you roll your eyes, patriarchy had a very specific legal form in 18th century British America, and it may make you look at marriage in a whole new light. Today, we'll talk about personhood, marriage, and the unexpected repercussions felt into the late 20th century with Dr. Karen Wolf. This is too complicated for history. Our guest today is Dr. Karen Wolf, a professor of history at Brown University and the director and librarian at the John Carter Brown Library. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Lynn, the, uh, we wanted to talk to Karen about this particular subject. I know the audience doesn't know what that subject is yes. just yet, <laughs> because it became a fascination of mine when we were researching the uh, television show, right? Yes, when I first explained it to you, I remember a look of you were quite stumped and confused as to how how it existed the way I was explaining it, which I loved because then you got to explore it more and sort of learn to understand the 18th century and why what it was made sense at the time. Not really made. Well, yeah, I'll say that. It's a tough <laughs> but, one. And to break the tension for the audience, but the idea that we're talking about is <laughs> coverture. Coverture, which is a word you probably have never heard before. Um, it doesn't come up in a lot of like textbooks. It gets referenced occasionally in some history mm -hmm. books about women uh, uh, and the lives of women in the 18th century before. But um, Karen, could you explain what coverture is for you know, probably the majority of the audience listening? <laughs> sure. Um, so I think to explain the concept of coverture, which is a legal doctrine, you have to start with the P word. And the P word is patriarchy. So <laughs> patriarchy is, you know, a kind of trans historical concept about male dominion over women. Um, but in the British American context, there's a very, there's a, there's a variety of, but in this case, one specific legal doctrine, one specific legal form that the kind of theory of patriarchy takes, which is coverture. And that is the idea. And in fact, enforced through law, that married women are in essence covered as legal entities by their husbands. Another way to describe this is the idea, um, which some historians use a kind of fancy phrase, the principle of legal unity or the principle of marital unity. But that basic idea is that once people are married, they don't have any separate interests. They agree on everything. All of their interests are the same. And those interests can be represented by the husbands. So married women don't have to have any independent legal capacity or really any independent legal position at all. So there are all these things they can't do as independent legal actors. They can't sign contracts in their own name. They can't appear in court. They're just like kind of legal non-entities once they're married because they are covered by their husbands. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's a stumper. Still had that look I, on I his agree face. because it's so contrary <laughs> to everything we think about how independence, like individual people have autonomy, that adult right. people have autonomy. And this is a complete erasure of that concept. So it seems very striking to us. But in fact, coverture is um, is a pervasive, um, I mean, it is legally enforced throughout British America. And in fact, it has really long tentacles into the late 20th century. Yeah, it runs so counter to not even like just individuals and how individual actors just uh, the idea of personhood, like I, mm -hmm. I, I and the inseparability of like the legal person from the person person in our current world because you know that that, that that doesn't often get severed that connection um and it, it took a long while for me to even understand but one, one, once i got dug a little bit deeper and then explained uh it in more 
depth to me, it helped me understand the structure of society because it's so fundamental that it was impossible for me to conceptualize. I thought so much stuff didn't make sense. Like it was just felt like, oh, people were just backwards and weird back then. And 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 it, none of it quite clicked until you kind of figure out like, oh, this is what they considered, you know, to be a person. This is how someone could act, act in public and, and, and be a public person or a legal person. It's su- super fascinating. Right. And yeah. I, I remember comparing it to children that, you know, basically the wife is is in the same situation as the children under the, the husband. He was sort of the representative of, you know, the family or the person, I guess the whole family is sort of one legal person, which well, thinking I mean, one, of today is. Quite- yeah. I, you know, one thing people ask a lot about is um, why couldn't women vote like right at the, you know, right at the outset of the American Revolution? Right. Why does it take so long for women to gain the right to vote? And, uh, you know, we should be clear here, we're talking about free women. Um, and, right. you know, when we're talking about women in general as a category, it's such a complicated one because women are not one category. They're mm-hmm. people who have a whole variety of different positions and privileges. And I want to go back to that in our conversation. Um, but let's just, for the moment, hold with um, free married women. Why couldn't women vote? And mm-hmm. the concept, it's its not just that uh, women are totally covered by their husbands and so they're made legally incapacitated. It's that the idea is that they wouldn't need to, they shouldn't have an independent legal position. They shouldn't have an independent political position. So when women are arguing for women's independent rights, they're really arguing against this whole idea that they should have this kind of unity of interests with their husbands. And that idea hangs on for a really long time. Yeah, I mean, you can see tendrils of that eking its way all the way into the late 20th century. I'm thinking of, you know, divorce laws in the 1950s and 60s, where you had to have agreement basically on both parties that this is something that you can, you were going to do. And if you didn't, you couldn't do it. It wasn't something that women well, could do on their own. I remember my mom talking about um, trying to get a credit card in her mm-hmm, own name mm-hmm, in the 1970s. Yeah. And she couldn't because she was married. She couldn't get an independent credit card. Are you kidding me? She would need to get my dad to sign it or have a, you know, have a joint card with my dad or something like that. Um, But just, you know, the weird thing about coverture is that it's both um, embedded in the kind of the P word patriarchy, but um, but also in the British American obsession with property as really the fundamental structure of law. I mean, other legal regimes are obsessed about different things. But British American law is so obsessed with, it's so much about property, like how you deal with who owns what and who can do what with their property and who can't do what with somebody else's property and so on. So coverture is um, about creating, um, making women, once they get married, kind of independently, you know, incapacitated. It makes them total dependence. But it does that by saying you can't own property. They can't own property in their own names, or they can't, even if they do inherit property unusually in their own names, they can't do anything with it. Their husbands have to be the manager of it. So it's really tied to property. So it makes, Mm -hmm. weirdly, complete sense that, of course, my mom couldn't get a credit card in her own name. Even though Mm -hmm. lots of law had changed over those centuries, the fundamental assumption that you would have a kind of household unity was right there in saying, no, you cannot have a Sears credit card. Sorry. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. No, Mrs. Wolf. <laughs> Sears doesn't want you to have a credit card. <laughs> it is mind boggling. So this question okay. comes directly just from my study of Martha Washington. So I'm talking about, you know, an elite white woman. But when she became a widow, she finally had rights that she didn't have when she was married. And it seems like she could have chose to stay single and she would have been able to keep these rights. But then she chose to remarry. And obviously it's very important when you remarry to remarry someone who's trustworthy because they're essentially now going to be in control of your children and any property that your deceased husband left to you. Is that Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why would anyone... 
I mean, that's <laughs> terrible to say. Why would you remarry? Why would you do that? <laughs> well, what's interesting is, um, you know, I mean, we know that like across the 18th century, it's pretty hard to come up, you know, to deal with demographic data. Like we just, mm -hmm. you know, we can't, we, it's really hard. We can make generalizations, but in the areas where we've been able to count and to estimate across the early modern world, you can see that women remarry at half the rate that men do. In other words, when men are widowed, they remarry mm -hmm. fast and regularly and women do it much more slowly and less often. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, so there, you know, for every individual, there's surely a reason why or why not. And there are mm -hmm. surely local situations and there are very individual situations. But overall, it does seem to be that women more than men preferred to remain unmarried. And, you know, when you look at the arrangement of just domestic labor, and by domestic labor, I don't mean like sweeping the stoop. I mean, the amount of like care, child care, arranging the household, which mm -hmm. is where the economy is completely organized in this period. You think you really need a wife, um, but a husband, um, one could argue somewhat less <laughs> so. That's super not to get on a on a psychology tangent, but like I, that's so fascinating <laughs> that 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 statistic is true because I've heard that reference to people who actually separate today. That generally mm -hmm. speaking, when when people the couples break up and, and couples get divorced, men do it because there's someone else, like they're they're mm -hmm. going to quickly shift into another relationship, and women do it because they want to be separate <laughs> on their own <laughs> on their own. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's so yeah. interesting. The, um, well, there are just deep structural things here that still pertain from that early period about expectations about women's lives. Um, and, you know, a super great historian, Judith Bennett of the medieval mm -hmm. period, wrote a great book about um, basically the long continuities in women's history, that mm -hmm. sometimes history itself is a discipline which emphasizes change over time. But it does that by paying attention to politics and economics. Mm -hmm. And yes, turns out that politics and economics do change quite a lot. La, 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 la. You get you get change, you know, mm -hmm. in technology. But there are things that really don't change and that we should be paying attention to continuities as much. Mm -hmm. And it's astonishing and terrifying when you look, for example, at the divergence in wages between women who are brewers in England in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. And women who are anything now in the 21st century. And the wage gap is almost constant. Huh. So anyway, if we if we thought about women's lives, we would think more about continuities, I think, than, than change over historical time. And so some of what you're talking about, why would women want to be on their own and why would men want to be married? Well, there's some probably some deep structural expectations around um, gendered labor that have something to do with that. And I think what you're saying is we need to know our history because it's mm -hmm. very relevant today. Absolutely. Right, Isaac? <laughs> oh, well, don't go to your pitching the themes of the of the podcast there, Lynn. <laughs> oh, right. You can't be that explicit with the listeners. You give a peek behind the curtain. But yeah, I, that, that, I mean, it's a... Um, this is one of those things and sort of structurally, because I, it, it was funny enough, right. As, as right around the time we started working on this, because I had actually just gotten married and, and, mm -hmm. um, the understand, you know, it, the current world and current and marriage is, you know, very, very much different, but a lot of things are very much the same and, and traditional expectations for just, you know, gendered labor within the marriage mm -hmm. are still super pervasive. Like I cook exclusively. Yeah. My mm -hmm. wife does not, she can make cereal. Can't do anything else. Sorry, I don't trust her to do pretty much anything else. Um, and it was a very, so my, my family comes from India. My grandmother's pretty traditional. And it was like a very big problem for her that my oh, wife yeah. didn't really like or enjoy or know how to cook. So much so that for every birthday and Christmas, she would get some sort of like kitchen apparatus for her. You know, despite <laughs> oh, the fact geez. that, yeah, I swear. Um, and, and, and. I, I, like it, it going back, it was something that we were super conscious of and wanting to make sure that we didn't, we perpetuated the things we wanted, the traditions we wanted to perpetuate and then left off the things that we didn't want to do. But it was, so, it was a conscious effort because so much of this is deep seated. And like you said, it goes back yeah. centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, so you have to yeah. actively fight against them. Um, so yes, you yeah. have to know your history. <laughs> 
So sorry for the interruption, but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's really it's I mean, and some of it is so is so complicated, and you know you can you can identify some of those deep seated historical inequities, and sometimes you still participate in them anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. I have always been the primary caregiver for my kids, and I'm a possibly over enthusiastic mom. And I mean, they would say so because they're now young adults. Um, <laughs> but, um, but you know, I can see like, okay, so that is like very stereotypical thing. And yet I still want to do it. So right. yeah, complicated, right. really complicated. And that goes to your question, Lynn, about like, you know, their individual circumstances. Why would Martha Washington want to marry George mm-hmm. um, when she could have been a wealthy, independent widow? Right. Um, and, you know, life could have been very different for her mm-hmm. as an independent widow exercising all of that property um, that came from the Custises um, that, that would have been different. And I haven't read her. I haven't read um, her husband's, her first husband's will. But, you know, a lot of men wrote wills in the 18th century that said, you know, I'm well, there are two different things here. One, I guess the payoff, it's not really, but the way that uh, that that one way that that coverture is supposed to work is that when uh, women are widowed, they get access to one third of their husband's real estate mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. the use of their life. They don't get to own it, so they don't get to like sell it and do something different with it. It's not like right. you can inherit some of that and like sell it all and go to Vegas. You can't do that. You can just <laughs> like you get that one third. You get to use it for your lifetime. It's not inalienable property. You know, it's like, it's, it's just, yeah, it's like a house with a lien the, on it or whatever. They, like oh someone else, yeah, someone yes. else has an investment yeah, in the property. It's super yeah. awkward because right. sometimes it literally is a third of a house. <laughs> um, because if let's think if the husband has a house, like, and the doubt da- it's called the dower portion and you get that dower portion for your lifetime. And there are lots of really tragic cases of, you know, women kind of living with their adult children in their dower portion of a house. And anyway, and there are a lot, you can imagine a lot of arrangements that have to be made, but she could have lived on that dower portion. Um, or sometimes maybe, you know, her husband willed her more, but it was pretty common for whatever else women might have inherited from their husbands for that to be cut off if they married again. So, I give to my wife, you know, ABC until she marries again, unless and until she marries again. So, you know, she might have had a great deal of property to to manage and she might have lived comfortably, but it also might have been a burdensome estate and she might have just wanted support with it. Um, you know, when her kids were young and um, very young. who knows? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, what kind of family and, you know, and so on. And apparently George was, a, you know, a good husband. And so I guess she liked him. So <laughs> there was that. Well, she went to eight winter encampments of the war. So she must have <laughs> liked him yeah. a little bit. Um, but interestingly, her first husband didn't have a will. He actually died without a will. And oh, wow. Irresponsible. A, right. And there was Dude, a lot of bad. money involved. Um, well, but I don't re- see that would have. That would have been miserable for her because then she would have been because the intestate this here's a here's a coverture thing, which is that, uh, well, this is true of all intestate cases. When people mm-hmm. die without a will, then it went to the particular structures of the colony or state mm-hmm. um, to say what happens to your money when you die without leaving a specific will. Right. And you can't get out of the dower portion, but she wouldn't have gotten anything more then because she would have only had the dower portion and then everything else would have gone to the kids in trust. Right, um, And she might not even have been the guardian, depending. I mean, I don't know if they appointed her the guardian to her children, but often they would appoint um, somebody other than the mother as the guardian. So she could have been in a much more constrained situation as a widow with seemingly a lot of property. So right. maybe that's... That's a good reason and why. She she was the guardian and she tried. I mean, she needed help. And she actually asked John Robinson, who was the Speaker mm-hmm. of the House um, in Virginia, um, if he would be the temporary guardian. And he said no, yeah. because I think it's a lot of work. It's, because if you a look at the guardian work. council, of George of Washington, it's yeah. it's like, you know, yeah, you're the you're the new father of these kids. But that means anytime you spend money on them, you have to. You have to record it so you have this whole ledger yeah. book of everything they spent money on because it's not your money. It's their money from the from the yeah. estate of their father. It gets very confusing. 
I was like, and people yeah, complain about drag. IRS deductions. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's where it comes from exactly. no. yeah. um, so out of curiosity is the, the fact that the, the the independence of someone who is widowed is that uh, just out of like there's no other really good option to for what to, to do because they, beca- they they adopt this sort of semi-autonomous legal status right for, for, mm-hmm. but is, is that just because the, you know there's there is no obvious man to then cover her is, is that really sort of the idea so what's What's interesting is that um, coverture, so coverture is expressly about marriage. Mm. Um, it's not about women per se, gotcha. <laughs> but huh. it is about marriage. <laughs> it's about married women. So it really is the case that young adult women who are not married yet, even if they do marry later, and widowed women are not under coverture. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I actually, that was, that was the, what I wrote my first book about was like women who were not wives um, and what kind of independence, what did they do with their, um, with their independent legal status? And they did plenty of things. They did all the same things that men did. They mm-hmm. invested money and they wrote contracts and they bought things and they sold things, including sometimes um, human beings. Um, mm-hmm. Women were, you know, invested in slavery or actually in purchasing enslaved individuals. Um they did all the same things that that men did. Basically, they um, they tended to be more slightly passive investors. So they would invest in real estates and ground rents and things like that that would give them kind of passive income. But they did all the same things. They took people to court and you know fought in court about things. They did all the same. You know, so it's really it's married women. But the but since the the presumption is that women will be married and will be mothers. Um, it's an overwhelming kind of not just legal status, but also an overwhelming kind of cultural convention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that might be what I was getting confused about. And I spe- maybe it's because of the analogy to children, Lynn, that mm-hmm. I was imagining, oh, you know, um, well, they're a child or a legal child. And, then, you know, they're, right. they're, they're, they're fathers, you know, covered by their father's legal status. Mm-hmm. And then, then they would go off to get married. But I guess that, they're, that there's not always a clean break between those right. two it's statuses. Not direct from yeah, it's not direct from father to husband. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I know. It's disturbing, really. I mean, it's a very it's a very weird structure and I think it's so alien to the way we think about things. And yet, it sits quite at the foundation of a lot of presumptions about women's incapacities and women's dependent status still in our society. Right, even so today. So I think people were Yeah, I think people would be surprised by this and yet at the same time some of the presumptions that guide it, they're not surprised by it at all. Hmm. One thing I always wondered about is, you know, the the presumption of of coverture is sort of the the man is in charge. He's the head of the family, which means everybody agrees and he makes the final decision. Um, and then that that's sort of the legal definition. And then I think about actual reality and how much men are really listening, you know, day to day to their wives and how much say the women really did have because they did you know, they controlled the household and domestic, which, like you said, that's economics, Um, you know, that's political. So do you think that um, sort of their legal status on the ground in reality was just as strong? Or do you think that it was maybe a little more something we would recognize today? Well, it's so it's so hard to um, it's hard to parse that a bit because Mm -hmm. We know that there are many men and women who were real partners in their businesses. And we can see that in the surviving records. We can see that they made decisions together. So we can go with another famous 18th century and presidential couple, John and Abigail Adams, for example. She's a great and savvy investor. She's managing their money, arguably much better than John Adams, the lawyer ever would. Um, especially when he's away during the revolution, she's managing their money. She's, you know, they they clearly are a kind of partnership marriage. They make decisions together. And yet at the same time, nothing changes the fact that she could not do that on her own and he could do it on his own. You know, mm-hmm. they, they don't, they mostly work together collaboratively and cooperatively, but structurally she doesn't have any choice about that. 
she has to work with him. He does mm-hmm. have a choice. So right. who gets to decide who's in the position of um, having to persuade and who's in the position of like, I don't really need to persuade her because I can do it if I want to. Um, I think it's really important to keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so much of, um, you know, kind of early modern and early American um, kind of household economy business that operates because husbands and wives work collaboratively together. Mm -hmm. But it just never erases the fact that structurally women are subordinated. Right. Yeah, that reminds me of the letter that she wrote to John as their... I think it's the Constitution, right? Or is it the Declaration of Independence? I forget where, which document they're, which historic document they're drafting. <laughs> um, but it's the one that yeah. always gets quoted and is sort of like you know yeah, a direct line to ladies. suffrage. Yeah, remember the ladies. Um, mm-hmm. that, yeah. That, um, yeah. But yeah, she had to convince him. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and he and he was and he wasn't that interested. Yeah. yeah, he tries to flirt back, and she's like. I wasn't flirting. I was being serious. <laughs> That's not what yeah, I was what doing does she there. call him? Yeah. What does yeah. he say? He says something about, he says, your silly little comment yeah, I don't or remember something. The, I don't remember the exact yeah, phrase, it's, but it's really irritating. It's very irritating. <laughs> yeah, very condescending. And, I, yeah. You can hear it. I can, I can see her face reading that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but th- yeah. that's interesting. When you say that the, um, the household economies, so and you're talking like households are economic, um, is that just because like that's where the majority of like expenses were done, or, or, or how is that? How, well, like, how I mean, can if I understand you, if we, that idea? If we if we think kind of most broadly, mm-hmm. um, you think about most people have farming households. If we're so, let's just stick with. Um, British America. Let's just mm-hmm. stick with the eighteen or the eighteen, the thirteen colonies, um, and then first states. Most people, um, most white and free people, are farming. Those households, farming is a collaborative effort. You know, there is labor that happens literally within the household to make that go. There's food production, childcare, clothing management. You know, all that kind of stuff that takes place literally mostly within the household, not entirely within the walls of the household, but mostly. And there's stuff that takes place out of the household that is, you know, cultivation of crops and so on and management of that labor. But then, you know, even if you look at um, semi-urban areas, which even the biggest cities are just, you know, we wouldn't consider them cities really. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, you know, so let's say artisan households, um, shoemakers or stave makers or whatever, there's still, there's an amount of, um, within the, ho- the walls of a household, um, kind of labor that has to happen, child care, food production, clothing, often a lot of accounting work and other things. And then there's the artisanal labor mm-hmm. and this has to happen together. Otherwise the place doesn't go, you know? So the household economy is really a way of describing how people have organized their economic lives, their labor around sustenance and even maybe, you know, beyond sustenance, making something more than that, um, that is totally household based. I mean, we could still say that, you know, people have a household economy, but most of what they're doing um, for that household economy is wage labor that's taking place elsewhere. Whereas in this world, most of what they're doing for that household economy is taking place pretty closely within the household, with the exception of some some professions, but not many. Okay, yeah. So most people's economic lives to today we have you know a corporate and business centric thing. So it's a, it's a third place, mm-hmm. it's or, or another place outside of your second yeah. place beside your home. Yeah. But back then it Factories was one or and the same. Retail or whatever. Right. There's like this kind of yeah external yeah. And what people are bringing into the household is wages, you know, and mm-hmm. that's a really a, like a 19th century development where what people are bringing into their household is wages mm. um, as opposed to producing the thing within the household. Right. And the work that was the, the you know, inter intra household work uh, that was traditionally that was traditionally like segmented gendered between the two, like certain things were like traditionally women's jobs and and then, you know, highly was the gendered. craftsman yes. stuff that was like, oh, that was the man's job. Yeah, highly gendered, except some things would surprise you because um, there are things that are uh, things that are weirdly gendered that you wouldn't think of as gendered. So, you know, there's um, 
poultry and dairying um, is is women's work generally um, huh. at a certain point, right? And you're like, well, why? I mean, there's no anyway. So there are certain things that are um, that are gendered, but we might, but not in ways that we might. I can, I can think of some weird Freudian reasons why, but <laughs> besides that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But actual functional yeah. reasons, that it sort of seems sort of arbitrary. Yeah, not not really. Yeah, not really. Yeah. But, huh. I, you know, I mean, we've mostly been talking here about a kind of, um, if not idealized, certainly about free um, white people's houses mm-hmm. um, right. and their household economies. But, you know, free white women are maybe a third of the women who live in this world that we're talking mm-hmm. about. Um, and other women are, you know, uh, divided between enslaved African or African descended women and indigenous women, and their lives look really different. Um, They're subordinated and constrained in ways, and sometimes directly, um, often, obviously for enslaved women by law, Mm -hmm. but not by coverture. Coverture is something, because marriage is in fact a a privilege reserved to free white people, coverture is also reserved to free white women. So enslaved people are are not allowed to marry. They're not allowed to have either the privileges or the burdens, in this case, um, of marriage. So enslaved women are not under coverture. And you can you can sort out once you think about this ideology of of dependency and of patriarchy, you can figure out like why that would be. But you know, no no enslaver is going to allow another man, a husband, to have a position of authority over a woman that he has enslaved. Hmm. Um, so, so actually, there is a logic here around the focus on marriage as a kind of a privileged uh, category, as having to do with a certain way in which property is arranged and in which property gets passed from one person to another and who controls it and why hmm. that is restrained to or constrained to um, free white people. So sorry for the interruption, but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors. Right. So patriarchy is really free white men. That's what we're talking yep. about. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I said right at the beginning of this conversation, we have to talk about the P word. It's really important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's fascinating. And you were talking about all like the functional um reasons for marriage, I guess, an exchange of property and how the property gets married. So in terms of marriage, even if just to sort of chip away at my underlying assumptions to make sure that I'm not bringing any, you know, modernist thought to, to this is, was so was marriage typically more of like a functional and transactional arrangement that was done back then? Or was there some relationships like, you know, b- bonds prior to the actual wedding that took place because uh, you no, know, when people so are together, eventually, they married for love or for yeah. family or money. I'm not saying that, that love okay. couldn't exist yeah. in a marriage. Like you know, like like I said, like I've, I, have, I have family yeah. members that have had arranged marriages. So like I know that mm-hmm. that can like, grow over time after the wedding. But I'm just like prior yeah. when you're setting up who is marrying yeah. who. Um, yeah. Well, I think you know it's so hard to sort out like what does that even mean in this earlier context? What does marital love mean? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when we're talking about this early American context, we're talking about, and these free white people, we're talking about people who are mostly Protestants. Um, mm-hmm. And for these Protestants, there is an emphasis on not what we would call like marital romantic love per se, like as a prerequisite, meet, fall, meet cute, fall in love, you know, get married kind of thing. Mm-hmm. There is an emphasis on the importance of a sexual relationship in marriage and the importance mm-hmm. of marriage as being a, a relationship which produces children. And so healthy sexuality is actually a healthy, you know, kind of, there is a strong kind of heteronormative marital relationship that's really, really emphasized. You can see even it's, you know, people talk about the Puritans as, um, you know, oh, the Puritans, and we have this notion that to be puritanical means to be kind of prudish. But actually, Mm -hmm. when you read like the Puritans and what they're writing about, they're like pretty straightforwardly like, yeah, sex. I mean, they're like really, (laughs) it's very important to them. So so it is not like romantic love is a language and an expectation that is really part of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Um, I would argue, and in fact, I would say, uh, you know, really brilliant, Historian 
who I had the privilege to teach. Lindsay Kider has written, is just in the middle of finishing a book about um, how deeply economics still structured marital expectations in the late 18th into the 19th century Mm -hmm. um, for wealthy individuals. Like that, you know, the language of romantic love was a kind of an overlay, kind of a frosting on the cake that was still about economic um, partnership. But it, you know, it doesn't mean that that peop- that affection didn't exist. It's just right, that right. the reality was that there was this structured, expected relationship that was men and women marry and have children together, and they partner in a household. That's the expectation. I'm I'm curious, and I and that this is it tends to be a subject where there's very little historical documentation. But you know, in in enslaved community, like on a particular plantation, say, absence, the uh, reason the structural functional reasons for creating a marriage bond. I know even though the marriages weren't typically legal, people still were married as a part, like mm-hmm. they were, you know, married pair pairs um, in that context. I'm curious if those were more romantic because there was no other reason to do it other than the fact that you, you had a, um, a relationship with a particular person, or at least there wasn't necessarily that other societal functional pressure. I think, um, I think it's so it's so painful to try to speculate, you know, about people who are in such constrained and terrible yeah. circumstances um, and in where, you know, circumstances which they're subjected to kind of casual violence and to the, you know, um, just the violent whims, basically, mm-hmm. um, of, of other people. That it's so hard to think about what what their emotional, the texture of their emotional lives would be like. But it's very it's very clear that when we look at, for example, um, ads of people who have claimed freedom for themselves, like newspaper ads where people are describing people who have run for freedom um, from the 18th into the 19th century, we can find plenty of examples where it will say, you can look for him in this place because his mother is there, where mm-hmm. you can look for him in this place because he there is a woman there. Or in other words, we see people running to their family members to mm-hmm. be with their family members. Like we just know those family relationships are really close and important. It's just, it's hard, it's hard to really think about, um, I think, what emotion seemed like mm-hmm. um, sure. in a world pre-Freud, in a world before we really even had the language to describe the things that we describe now. Um, I mean, affection for sure. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, I anyway, guess I was thinking of, of the um, <laughs> the work. Uh, uh, I think it's um, Dinah Ramey Berry writes a lot about um, you know the spaces where you could exert uh, mm-hmm. autonomy and spaces. So that mm-hmm. that it, you know it, 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 in you know forming a a marriage partnership with someone in that context is a choice mm-hmm. that's being done yeah. at a certain level. Yeah. So it's you know it's a it's a yeah. piece of life that you can sort of cordon off for yourself. Um, in yeah. a, in a, in a situation that's otherwise absence of a lot of those choices. Um, yeah. just interesting to, to I think, think about. I mean, and it's, it's interesting to think about too, because the, the contexts are so different in these different places. Um, like one thing that's interesting in the mid Atlantic is that we know that, um, there, there are intense family bonds and relationships that develop um, among enslaved people because there are generations of enslaved people mm-hmm. in basically the same region. So long period of time, um, whereas it doesn't look the same in the deeper South. Um, right. Just anyway, super interesting to think about. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things that I wish that there was more historical record. Um, and obviously there's a lot of people doing work and in, in, in uncovering what, what there is and, and trying to glean more information from that. But it, it, it's like, yeah. oh, just tan, like just to understand would be, you know, uh, uh, enlightening to be able to look and understand yeah, yeah. in a more concrete yeah. way. Yeah. Um, One of the places where um, I've been super interested to think about um, how people are expressing kind of family relationships is looking at um, freedom suits from the 18th century hmm. where, um, because one of the one of the grounds on which people can argue for freedom in the courts in Virginia in this there's this kind of moment in Virginia in the late 18th century where there's a, a kind of a lapse in the law regulating um, manumission where um, before that um, enslavers couldn't manumit anyone and anyway it's a long longer story there um, but there's this there's this uptick in in freedom suits in Virginia 
And one way that people can argue is to argue on the basis of having had a free female ancestor. So they can say, I'm not descended from enslaved people. Actually, there was a mistake, like my grandmother, my great grandmother, whatever. Um, And it's so moving. Sorry, this is a long tangent, but it's so moving and also really revealing to see the oral testimony of people describing their family histories over generations, like, cause you know, those family histories were passed orally, you know, and, mm-hmm. right. um, it's really super, super interesting to see how intense those family, um, histories were and how closely and, and they were kept. Right. For, for the audience, I know I've, I've said this before, but, uh, uh, for those who don't know, manumission is when an enslaver grants freedom to, to someone who yes. they are holding, um, yes. in bondage, um, yes. as opposed to emancipation, document. which is like a third party, you know, granting that freedom. Yes. Main admission is when the, the enslaver directly does it. Right. So as, as Isaac was talking about this idea of personhood and how um, the woman wasn't an individual under coverture legally, um, couldn't you say the same for anyone who is enslaved? Because they're also not looked at as individual actors who have a legal entity, I should say. Yeah, it's just so interesting because um, in 18th century American history, there's so much emphasis on independence. Um, Obviously, the independence of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, the, you know, um, rebellion from (laughs) Britain and the achievement of independence. It was part of the brand back then. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) Totally. Um, But the thing is that dependence is such, is a status that is so deeply rooted in that society that right. independence is the unusual situation mm. um and you know i think what's what's so striking is that when some men achieve independence that's what's the big deal is that some men achieve independence mm-hmm. um and uh you know but it doesn't eradicate the fact that the majority of people are in a dependent status I remember in a conversation with colleagues about 2026 and the coming um, celebration of American independence, the 250th anniversary in 2026. And I was saying that, you know, the language of of the revolution is is amazing, but it's also true that it didn't apply to a majority of Virginians at the time. And a colleague was said, you can't say that it didn't what do you mean? And I was like, well, actually you can just count up. <laughs> it did not apply to the majority of people. Yep. Um, you know, think about it. It was actually a pretty small minority that would have been eligible for the kind of independence that the language of revolution celebrated. Yeah. That context is really important, at least from the base point from which they were operating because of, yeah, well that, you know, it, that's a hundred percent true. Um, it, w- it is still a remarkable paradigm shift in the way the world was operating, even for that small subset of the population to, to, to gain that. So, you know, it, without understanding that, hey, this, they were operating in a place where no one had that level of independence or no one mm-hmm. really or, or, you know, very, very, very few. Um, it was an expansion of it that, you know, at least started with the series of future expansions and hopefully, you know, will continue forward. Um, we can but, argue about uh, that on another episode of your podcast. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I'm curious. I'm curious what, what, what you would think about that. But it, the context by which you're understanding of like, hey, this is a small subset, and you know, the uh, and from which they were operating before that is super important because um, I do think that people talk about the revolution and the principles of the revolution mm-hmm. and ignore the context uh, oftentimes, yeah. uh, especially in public yeah. discussions of, of of things, not outside of the academic sphere. Yeah, that's why individual stories, I think, are so important, because you can read the stories of, yes, the the wealthy white men, but you could read the stories of women in many different circumstances and, you know, uh, many, you know, enslaved men. And you get a much better idea that's sort of away from this, you know, legal world into um, sort of lived experience, because everyone, ha- you know, we're historians, we label people you know we have the wealth but when you get right down to it even when you're talking about why would enslaved people get married yet they're in you know horrible circumstances but they're still human beings and sort of we all at you know 
at our core sort of crave the same things and some and that's you know human connection and mm. um love uh children perhaps um and so I'm not sure where I'm going with this, only that I was going to be a little bit mushy and point out why, you know, all of this history is so fascinating and why it's so important to then go from these uh, labeled groups to individual stories Mm. and their lived experience. And that's when you really see who who gained what from an event like the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's true. I think it's, um, you know, and I also think it's the reverse is true. That is, you can look at um, individual lives and there's so many incredible and, you know, we're able to recover the lives of many more people now, thankfully with, you know, research methods and Mm -hmm. um, source materials becoming available. And, um, and even as we do recover individual people's stories, we also want to think about them in terms of these, these wider contexts, like never see them outside of these wider contexts. That's why I think like some of the debates over, um, over the founding fathers are so interesting because, you know, to say that um, Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Hamilton, whatever, to talk about their, um, their investment in, their entanglement in, their complicity in, their, their direct involvement in things like slavery and dispossession of Native people too. Um, it's like you have to contextualize them in terms of their own time. They did mm-hmm. all of these things. They did some great things and they did some completely terrible things. Mm-hmm. But we have to see the individual in terms of the full context. And the context of that time is a pretty terrible one. Right. Yeah. And uh, that, at, at some level, it's it's we think that um, at least in the context of the time that they didn't know any better, but there were oh. plenty of people who understood, and 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 yes. it, it's not like oh they were just ignorant to the fact that this this, this was bad. Um, no, that's not no, that always, true. No, yeah, no, that always kills me when people say that. You know. Um, oh, you know, you'd have to judge. I just mean we have to see the full context. I don't mean in any way like, oh, you have to judge them in terms of the context of their time. It's like, okay, could we judge them in the context of the people who were enslaved? I'm pretty confident that the 40% of Virginians in the 18th century, I always recur to Virginia because I'm a Virginian, Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, the 40% of Virginians who were enslaved at the time of the revolution were pretty clearly abolitionists. Mm -hmm. I I am willing to bet a lot on that. So... Um, you know, in addition to the fact that there were, you know, that there were white people in Virginia, very prominent ones who were abolitionists and who were articulating the evils of slavery. And Jefferson himself, you know, was ambivalent in some context, except, of course, he never did anything about it. Um, but, you know, enslaved people themselves were the most articulate abolitionists, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there, were, there may not have been abolitionists the way we view it as in the 19th century movement to abolition that led to, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation. But th- there were definitely people who were anti-slavery at the time, you know, both, you know, Absolutely. people who were enslaved and people who had been formerly sla- enslaved and free blacks. But also there were plenty of white people <laughs> who actively yeah. advocated. I mean, I'm from Pennsylvania. I have to throw the steam up. So is Lynn, actually. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I am, but I live in Virginia now, so yeah. I can see both sides. <laughs> but even the Quakers generally over time had a relatively anti-slavery point of view and, and, and viewed the institution as, you know, probably morally bad <laughs> before, um, you know, and that's 18th century. That's like around the time of the founding that they were like, hey, this isn't a good idea. We should probably stop doing yeah. this to other people. Um, it's not like yeah. they, they had never, oh, gee whiz, I'd never thought of that before. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't yeah. deny these yeah. people their, you know, basic human rights. Yeah, right, but, yeah. Um, but to, to loop all the way back around to coverture, <laughs> uh, 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 the topic of what, what we're here to say is, I, I think that that is, both of those things are related in, in, in the concepts of personhood. Things we take for granted today um, don't necessarily apply. And, and, and this is one of those deep cuts of a concept that, like, like I said in the very beginning, unless you understand, it's impossible to understand the structure of society at the time, why people mm-hmm. did things, how they did things, why certain events occurred the way they did, unless you get yep. some of these underlying foundational ideas about how things are structured, it's just impossible to understand. It won't make sense. You'll be connecting two dots and missing four in the middle. Um, that give you the full picture. Yeah, no, I mean, and you know, when we talk about 
um, what independence actually meant for men. And we were not able to really think about the fundamental reason why, even in some places, women could vote. You know, there's this like little hiccup in New Jersey, which allows mm-hmm. women to vote briefly in the 1790s and to the early 19th century. But when we think about why women are just, you know, completely erased from the possibility for political participation, we also know that most men, most free white men, didn't own property. And the expectation was that to vote and to be a full participant in the polity, to be a full civic actor, you needed to be a free white adult male property owner. Mm -hmm. And that last one, the property owner thing, that only goes away in the earlier 19th century. And it's huge when it does, because then it really converts to, then you just need to be a free white adult male, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, So then- but but that property owning qualification, like all of that stuff, it's like, why would that stick there? Well, right. It makes more sense when you think about how this whole property regime is wrapped around ideas about gender independence. And, you know, women are meant to be dependent and covered by husbands who are independent, who are supposed to have some kind of property, like property gives them capacity. One of the niftiest, I guess, pieces of um, research on the question of gender and property and civic capacity that I've ever read is from a decades old bit of work from the historian Terry Snyder and, um, and, and working with John Culp. And they found a couple of examples of women in Virginia who were widows, who owned property in their own right, who essentially transferred property to men so those men could vote and could vote the way those women wanted them to. Nice. And I'm huh. like, that is is that not awesome? That is <laughs> like so that. cool. <laughs> I know. And it's just uh-huh. a small number. But I thought like that it's just so indicative of how twisted that relationship between gender and property and capacity um, really was. And of course, race. Wow. That's real. That's fascinating. I, I'd love to hear more about that or read that accounting. That's pretty crazy. That's um, super cool. And I think One of the things talking about voting that it took me a while to comprehend was, and I mean, we're pushing a little later as well, but the women who argued against women's rights to vote, who were actually saying, no, we shouldn't vote. Um, Can you talk about what was the perspective there? Yeah. And of course, I mean, you won't be surprised after this whole long discussion that the, that women who said women wouldn't need the right to vote said they're, essentially they're represented by their husbands. Why should they vote? Their husbands vote. That's good enough. It's Mm. it's all good, right? Right. Or some people argue that women would just vote the same way as their husbands. So what, you know, that's, in other words, they couldn't be independent. Um, Right. So either way, like you wouldn't want them to be independent or you wouldn't expect that they could be independent. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Lynn, if that, if that upsets you, um, I mean, don't go on TikTok. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> done <laughs> um, there's some interesting interesting discussions and worldviews that would be greatly um uh, uh benefited by understanding some of this some of this history uh yeah. but um karen uh, thank you so much for uh taking the time to speak with us today and and for the uh, people listening if you if they if you wanted if anyone wanted to sort of further explore coverture and women's history are there any like general places that you think that someone should start or like hey this is That's a great a book question. that gives you a just uh, you know a nice overview or yeah it's a really fascinating yeah. museum yeah, yeah. to go visit yeah yeah well uh Gosh, that's a huge question. And there are so many resources I would I would point people to. But, you know, I think um, Rosemary Zagari wrote a great book called Revolutionary Backlash, um, which is about politics and about the expectation that women would not participate in the benefits of revolutionary independence movement. And in that, she talks about coverture and she talks about these kind of gendered expectations of dependence and civic incapacity. It's a great book and it's readable. It's like a really, I mean, she's a great writer. It's a great yeah, long, So long I highly time, recommend that. Longtime listeners of the show uh, will remember Rosie from us talking about Thomas Law. She is a multiple, multidisciplinary, mm-hmm. very prolific <laughs> yeah. scholar. Very talented. Um, yeah. Indeed. So this is a completely different area of, of interest for her. Um, right. That is, that uh, is worth uh, uh, taking a read to. 
So uh, Karen, if any of our listeners wanted to follow your work, are you online or you have, do you have socials that, that you regularly post on? Is there a, a book that you'd like to plug or any, any papers that have been recently published? So I have a website, karenwolf.com and, uh, I put, and my social media feed is there and lots of stuff that I've been writing and speaking about is there. Um, so I'm pretty easy to find, um, on social media and also through my website. And obviously, uh, and uh, links to uh, Karen's work will, including her website, will be in the show description below. Absolutely, this was so much fun, Karen. So fascinating. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Really good to talk to you guys. It was really fun. I really loved our filming thing. It was so much fun, and this is fun too. So oh, great. I'm glad. Awesome. I'm, I'm really glad. We'll have to have you back on to argue about. Uh, uh, I guess the trajectory of American sort of <laughs> yes. the, the concept of independence and the trajectory and momentum set forth by the, where we should start the story. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Come on. 2026 <laughs> is coming. We have so much to talk about. Oh yes. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. well I'm look, looking forward to having that conversation as well. Thanks again. All right. Karen. Great. Thank All right. you. All right. Bye. Thank you for listening to the full episode of too complicated for history. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, please leave us a review on Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to follow us on our social media platforms at 2C4H underscore podcast, or check out the link in the description. This will keep you in the loop for show updates, new episodes, and exclusive content. Too Complicated for History is a podcast from Primary Source Media, produced by Patrick Long and Lynn Price Robbins, edited and mixed by Curtis Fritch, opening theme music by Sheena Biratello.